大家好，有会说普通话的人吗？有、哦，你好，你好，啊、哦哦呃，一个。Uh, yeah. uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I said hello and I asked you if anybody here speaks um, Chinese. Um, I am going to tell you a little bit about why I am speaking Chinese today and why I've been studying Chinese for the last two years. Um, it actually all goes back to uh, something I read about um, this fellow, uh, Hermann Ebbinghaus. Uh, Hermann Ebbinghaus, uh, how many people here have heard of uh, Ebbinghaus? Uh, in some ways, perhaps he is the father of the contemplative self-movement. He was, in the mid to late 19th century, a psychologist. And he did something which doesn't sound like a hell of a lot of fun. What he did was he wrote down um, lines and lines of uh, random three-character expressions, um, and uh, 20 at a time. And what he then did was he set himself the task to learn these lists. Um, he did this uh, full-time for a year, um, and he studied himself as he did so, and figured out exactly at what point would he forget which things and what was the best way to study these. Um, he enjoyed it so much, three years later he did it again. Um, and he found something fascinating, which a lot of you will be familiar with now, which is he discovered that the, he could actually predict quite accurately when he would forget something, and he found that it was a curve that looks like this. And he discovered that if he um, reviewed something at that 90% uh, likelihood point um, again, um, that became flatter. And if he did it at the 90% point again, it became flatter still. And um, he wasn't much of a paper writer. I think he actually wrote zero papers in his life. Um, uh, and this work was largely forgotten. Um, it was um, some hundred years later uh, that a fellow named Piotr Wozniak um, rediscovered this effect. Um, and he actually wrote some software this time to help him do this. And rather than just learn strings or random characters, he actually studied interesting facts. Um, he actually wrote a piece of software which still exists today, and it's called Super Memo. Um, Nowadays, this system is called spaced repetitive learning, and it is, um, there have been a number of developments to the algorithm, and it's considered the optimal way to remember facts. Um, I decided to try and study this for myself, and I wanted something that I could study for a long time. Uh, apparently, according to the CIA, learning Chinese takes four times longer than learning French, Spanish, or German, so that seemed like a pretty good thing to do. So I thought I would try and learn Chinese. Um, um, being mildly obsessive and mildly geeky. The first three months I didn't learn any Chinese, but instead, instead uh, studied learning theory and wrote my own software for learning it <laughs> and tracking my progress as I went. Um, uh, so I've been learning Chinese now for two years, um, using basically nothing about the system that I've developed, and have been tracking myself as I did so at things like time of day, when I slept, what I ate, um, the position that I was in, uh, the method that I was using, and uh, so forth. Um, some of that history you can actually see uh, here, which is a graph created by Anki. Anki is a replacement for Super Memo, which is easier to use, more open. Um, the data for it sits in a SQLite database, so I've actually written tens of thousands of code to put data both into that and take it out of that. Um, and this here represents my performance in one aspect of learning Chinese, which is remembering the characters. Um, which I did using a system developed at the University of Hawaii. It's basically a mnemonic type memory palace uh, technique. Um, and there are some interesting features of this graph. One of them is this um, jump here, um, which in theory ought to be impossible. Um, I read a number of things on a Chinese learning forum that suggested that it was not possible to learn 30 characters per day and keep them, um, let alone both read and write and learn pronunciation and learn the meaning. Um, you can see here that this is exactly what I did over a three-week period, at the same time as having a nice holiday in Hong Kong. Um, I am very, very bad at language, and I am very, very bad at remembering things. Um, so the entire reason that I was able to do this was because I used the techniques that I've both developed and learned about, and um, the things I found about it myself. So here are some of the things that I found. Um, one is um, really interesting. I discovered that if I am walking on a treadmill at 1.2 miles per hour at, a, at a one degree incline, um, I have an error rate of about um, 5%, or else if I don't, it's about 8%. 
Um, I also know that I can do that for an hour, whereas normally if I'm just sitting down, I can only work for 20 minutes. It, this is very, very exhausting because as you saw from that little graph, where this is actually designed to be a method where every time you study a flashcard, you're kind of on the verge of forgetting. So this is a very, very tiring type of um, exercise to do. I also discovered at the end of that hour, I was ready to do something else, where else at the end of 20 minutes normally I would take a nap. Yeah, totally ready for a rest. Um, I also discovered that I was 40% faster. So one of the things that Anki actually tells you as you go is uh, mm. down here, it actually keeps track of information about your performance today and your performance um, over history and so forth. And this uh, green li line actually goes red if you're going underneath kind of where you'd be expected to be. So the nice thing about using this system is I've got the same hours work that I do every single day and I can see exactly how I'm going. It also tells me if I'm in the mood to do something difficult or creative. I know that if I'm getting above 95% recall, um, it actually tells me that I can go and do something else interesting straight away. Um, I can't normally predict what my performance is going to be until I actually start doing it. Then I learn a lot about myself. Um, at the end of one year of doing this, I went to China for three months to their number one language university, Beijing Language University. Um, after one year of studying on my own for um, an hour a day, um, I was placed into the same class which contained um, pe people who were all masters or above students, and I became top of that class. Wow. Um, and so again, I'm terrible at memory and I'm terrible at language. I uh, got 28% for year eight French and never studied language again. <laughs> um, so what this told me was that using both things like mnemonic based systems for learning characters, uh, using spaced repetitive learning techniques, and also studying my own performance so that I could actually understand the, the best way for me to learn and to give myself an environment suitable for learning um, made a huge difference. The other thing I discovered is I enjoyed it a lot more. Um, I actually, I love my Chinese every day. It's, it's, it's like a restful thing that I know that I can always do, and it's a little thing I can go away and study. Um, and, you know, in, in a world where, you know, I now run a startup, every day is full of, of you know, decisions and challenges, I actually find it a, a real pleasure. Thank you. Gary for the first question over here. Okay, Jeremy, I've never met anybody more obsessed with spaced repetition than me in my life until today, and I think you are more obsessed than me even. Uh, Gary, I actually, the place I came across Peter Wozniak and um, Herman Ebbinghaus, I looked it up yesterday. It was a Wired article, it turns out you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that article was one of the inspirations for starting QS, so this is a very, very beautiful moment for me, and what I want to ask you is, what are your open questions? This leads to a lot of question asking as well as a lot of question answering. So when you look at what you've accumulated in terms of data, what what is what do you really want to know? I think the open questions are similar to the ones that perhaps we see when we look at Ebbinghaus's work. Um, he was perhaps most criticized because his only um, experimental subject was himself. And I think you could say the same about Wozniak. I today am now applying this to my own startup. For example, I am installing treadmills in our offices um, and I am teaching people about, for example, the power of studying in multiple different locations and the importance of moving. Uh, these are all not particularly new insights to me, but they're things I've confirmed for myself. Um, I will be interested to see how my staff reacts to these kind of challenges of doing things in different ways to what they're used to, and whether these kinds of approaches are things which um, everybody can harness, or whether it's a certain kind of person, or whether it's just mildly obsessive people like me, and, and you perhaps. <laughs> Kevin, go ahead. So um, it seems like you did some testing to, to establish that doing this on a treadmill was better than doing it sitting down. Have you tried butter? Have you tried, um, to have you tried uh, any other kinds of, of self-experimenting in terms of seeing what, what else might? Uh, yeah. <coughs> um, one thing I've discovered is time of day. 
Um, and interestingly, I've actually just read some research last week that backs this up. Um, I discovered that if I do my reviews first thing in the morning, as literally as soon as I wake up, um, I get through them much faster and with much lower error rate. However, if I study my new cards, in other words, the new characters, sentences, and so forth, the day in the evening, I get a much better recall. And I actually, I literally, it was like yesterday or the day before, I saw a summary of a paper that's just come out which found exactly the same thing, that when people were asked to memorize um, novel facts, uh, new facts, they were able to do so better and for a longer, an extended period of time if the first time they did it was just before they went to bed. Good question of that. How would this apply to actors learning a script, like learning their lines, and you mentioned learning novel facts. What about uh, preparing for Jeopardy? Um, yeah, well, I mean, there's that very famous talk uh, online by, the, by one of the world record holders in Jeopardy who used a lot of self-analysis to in, in a similar way. And I think the message there that I got from that was, it was amazing how similar it was. He had an actual database, he tracked his performance over time, he analyzed the segments to see which was difficult and which was easy. Um, so you know, I'd certainly suggest looking up that talk. The other thing I'd suggest looking up is actually Piotr uh, Wozniak's website, where he has 20 rules for memorizing facts, which I think are fantastic. I mean, they're things which you would probably know a whole bunch of them, but it's worth seeing them in one place. Things like um, make sure each fact is as small as it can be. Um, you know, um, use uh, lot, as much context as possible. And so, for example, with Chinese, there's a system I use developed at the University of Hawaii for learning Chinese characters and incorporates a massive amount of narrative type context around phonetics and sound structures and meanings and tones and so forth. Um, so, you know, I think for learning lines as an actor, um, you know, I, I think the kinds of things that you get from things like uh, Wozniak's research and space repetitive learning in general, you know, I think they all would apply equally well. Um, and in this case, the context you're looking for, I think, would probably be more the emotional context of the narrative structure of the story, you know, so that you're learning things within the context of, of the story rather than independently. That would be my guess. i just add for people who want to find that uh, Jeopardy talk, um, just go to quantifiedself.com and in the search box type in Jeopardy. Um, I think the talk you're referring to was actually at a, the New York QS meetup. So it's on there. It's a question over here. Yeah. Your graph that you showed, I'd like to understand it, but I don't know what the axes are. Can you? So the uh, x-axis was time and the y-axis was the number of characters that I had learned at that point. So there were certain flat sections that represented periods of time where I um, stopped learning characters. from a negative number and went to? No, it wasn't negative. It started at zero. Oh, I see. OK, relative to, OK, got it. Um, back in the corner. Oh, yeah. Also, in regard to that graph, the, uh, you mentioned that there was that spike right, right toward the end before the plateau, mm. and you said that wasn't theoretically it shouldn't have been possible. Well, can you explain how? Well, I mean, not theoretically, but just in terms of what I read, there was kind of a whole bunch of, there's a thing called ChineseForums.com where people discuss things like what is the limits of what's possible, and people kind of say, well, I managed to do this many characters or that many characters, and um, there was this kind of thing where people would say, wow, imagine if you could do 30 characters a day, and somebody would be like, oh, I did it for three days, but I didn't do the tone or the, or the, or the um, sound or uh, whatever. I mean, what, what do you attribute to that spike that you did? Well, I just decided. I mean, um, most of the time I was focusing, like not focusing on any one thing, I was mainly doing an approach called sentence mining, which was where I basically um, downloaded hundreds of thousands of sentences of parallel text from the internet and studied, um, you know, actual full sentences. And if I learned a new character, it was because there happened to be a new character in that sentence I was studying. Um, so early on, I was studying lots of new characters because every sentence was full of them. And as I went along, it became less and less. So for that three-week period, I actually decided I was going to study nothing but characters. So I just decided I would finish off um, what's called HSKC, which is you know a, a particular level of um, complexity of character based on the Chinese government's ranking system. So it's just a decision to focus on learning characters for three weeks. You yeah. So if you look at the derivative of this graph, you get a measure of your skill at learning a new character with time. And the spike suggested you had a jump in that skill. And I wanted to ask if this is a general property of the whole graph, if this is built 
sort of of plateaus and jumps, or is it a slowly rising uh, increase in your scale? Um, the, the graph is not a great um, descriptor of my overall ca capability of Chinese, because it only shows characters that I've learned. Um, and after the first 1600, which was a fairly constant um, thing, I, it slowed down because there were just less new characters that I come across on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a better graph would show the number of sentences or compound words or characters or radicals which I had learnt, which is basically a fairly constant graph, although it's been slowly accelerating as I've got better at these techniques. All right, so why don't we move on to the next speaker for now. Thanks to Jeremy.